Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending this first um, session of the afternoon part of, this afternoon, of today's proceedings. Um, uh, my name is Alex Massey. I'm a columnist for the Times and the Sunday Times in Scotland. Um, and it is uh, lovely to be with you all here today in the, the dark, glorious heart of the imperial capital <laughs> as we, uh, uh, as we uh, discuss uh, what the formal title of, of this session is, uh, is uh, Federal UK the way forward. But I think um, uh, as we have a distinguished panel drawn from all four parts of the realm, we will have uh, a, perhaps a slightly broader discussion on the state of the Union, state of the United Kingdom, uh, the challenges it currently faces. and. Uh, we may even have time after that uh, to explore the possibility of there being some solutions to uh, some of those challenges. Um, uh, I'm going to invite each of the panellists to speak for a few minutes representing their part of the United Kingdom, and, uh, so to speak, and then we'll have a general discussion. Uh, there'll be the opportunity for questions to be asked by, by Slido, um, which I trust you all know how to, to do. Um, uh, our panel is uh, first Carwin Jones, uh, former First Minister of Wales, uh, now honorary professor at uh, the University of Aberystwyth, amongst other things. Um, professor Katie Hayward from Queen's University Belfast. Nicola, professor Nicola McEwen from the University of Edinburgh. And Tony Travers from the London School of Economics. Um, so Carwin, if I could start with you, how do things look when viewed from Wales? Well, uh, thank you, uh, Alex. Things are unclear, if I can put it that way. I mean, first of all, uh, in answer to the question, is a federal uh, UK the way forward? Uh, the answer is maybe, <laughs> but practically it's hugely difficult. And I'm going to outline some of the practical issues there. Devolution in the UK has largely been about throwing powers at various groups of Celts in order to keep them quiet. Uh, it's not been done in a way that is symmetrical, uh, and nor has any account uh, been taken of the situation of England, the biggest entity within the UK. And so we have a settlement where in Wales we have a law-making, tax-varying parliament. We have our own version of stamp duty. We control a third of income tax, for example. We have primary law-making powers, obviously, in those areas uh, where we are responsible, that we are responsible for. Scotland goes a step further. Uh, the major difference, not the only difference, but the major difference between Wales and Scotland is that Scotland has control over its justice system and police. Wales is, bizarrely, the only country in the common law world that doesn't have its own legal jurisdiction. So the Welsh Parliament has no authority to enforce its own laws, bizarrely. It relies on Westminster to do it, in theory. And it means that the joint jurisdiction of England and Wales is the only jurisdiction anywhere where there are two legislatures within it responsible for the same policy areas. Uh, that uh, itself is a mess. And then Northern Ireland, where there are fewer tax varying powers, but greater lawmaking powers, control over employment law, over equality, over driver and vehicle licensing. And I know that my wife is from Belfast, there is a roaring trade in Northern Ireland car number plates being sold elsewhere in the UK as private plates, uh, which uh, is a great source of income, I'm sure, to uh, dealers in Northern Ireland. But it shows the asymmetry that exists within the UK. England, of course, doesn't exist politically. It has no existence because it has no parliament. Uh, it has no legal jurisdiction of its own. And, of course, uh, it has no political identity in that sense, which would surprise, of course, most people in England. It's that asymmetry that's the problem. If we're talking about a federal UK, we are talking, to my mind, about there being equivalent parliaments across the UK with the same powers, a symmetry of powers across the UK, as exists in the US, as exists in Germany. And so the first question is, is there a demand in East Anglia for a lawmaking tax varying parliament along the lines of what Wales has? And I don't believe that federalism can work without that symmetry. How can you have federalism where different areas have different powers and you have a federal parliament that sometimes sits as a federal parliament, sometimes sits as the parliament of East Anglia, sometimes sits as the parliament of uh, England, Wales and Northern Ireland? It, it, it's just a mess. It's not clear. Every federal system in the world that is properly federal, to my mind, has that symmetry where there is a distinction between powers that sit at sub-federal level and where there is a federal parliament that has distinct powers 
that are clear and where there is a separation between the federal parliament and those sub-state parliaments. It's the way it works in the US, where each state is sovereign, each state has its own jurisdiction, and of course there is federal jurisdiction on top of that because there's a federal uh, Congress that has powers that have been defined. The problem you run into then is parliamentary sovereignty, the fetish that exists within the UK. Parliamentary sovereignty, that concept that really existed only in the mind of one man in the 19th century A.V. Dicey, it didn't exist before then. There were mentions of something similar in the days when there was an English parliament, which disappeared in 1707. Remember that the UK parliament was, was not a takeover of, uh, by the English parliament of the Scottish parliament. And so English constitutional principles did not automatically apply as a result. Uh, some case law that, that looks at that uh, from, the, from the 1950s. So we have this scenario where parliamentary sovereignty you know, was invented largely in the 19th century. And if you were in the House of Commons in the 19th century and somebody said to you, there is a constitutional theory that says you can do whatever you want, you would say, that sounds good to me. After all, Westminster is, oddly enough, the institution that uh, keeps for itself the ultimate lawmaking power within the UK, but is itself subject to no laws. Without a written constitution, parliamentary sovereignty dictates that Westminster could just simply overrule any uh, sub-UK parliament, and that, of course, drives a very large hole through the question of federalism. I don't underestimate how difficult a written constitution is. It's not something that is on the agenda, to my mind, and it's not something that, it's something that would take many, many years to develop. But without a written constitution, I don't think federalism actually works. Because as long as you have one parliament over there that has the power to overrule everybody else, then it can't be federal. Federal systems rely on inherent powers that exist at sub-federal uh, level. So that is a, another issue we have to deal with. Alternatives? Well, one alternative might be to say there are four entities within the UK. They each enjoy their own sovereignty. They choose to pool that sovereignty in certain areas, such as defence, such as uh, border control, such as um, the fiscal and monetary union, such as general taxation. And you create a union parliament that deals with those areas that are agreed should be areas that are dealt with by the union parliament. So sovereignty goes up upwards from the uh, parliaments of the four uh, entities of the UK up to Westminster rather than the other way around. It's a bit of a cop-out because, of course, that system would suggest that any kind of regionalisation or regional government in England is a matter for England. Uh, and it neatly sidesteps the problem of England, but I doubt practically whether it uh, then deals with the, the sheer size of England and its sheer heft within the UK and how that could be dealt with. So, uh, looking forward to the conversation. We have an esteemed panel here, of course, but the question seems to have an easy answer in theory but it's a lot more complicated in practice. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Governor. I mean, if we want uh, to move from uh, things that are complicated in practice, um, I think we'll move to Northern Ireland. <laughs> uh, um, Katie, uh, how, how are things in Northern Ireland? What are the particular challenges um, for the smooth working of the, the union um, uh, viewed from a Northern Ireland perspective at present? Um, uh, obviously, there's the additional complication of a north-south dimension as well as east-west. Um, and to what extent has Brexit uh, broken uh, aspects of unionism in Northern Ireland and can it be fixed? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, mean, I mean, you have about four Alex. minutes. Uh, to, <laughs> Very good. Um, I'm going to uh, make some remarks that touch on what you're asking me, um, and I'm going to make sure that they say things that I, I sort of want to put on record from the beginning. Um, Interestingly enough, almost as an aside, the, the possibility of Northern Ireland in a federal UK isn't really on the cards with respect to the Good Friday Agreement as, as an option. It's quite interesting that the future of Northern Ireland could either be in a United Ireland or in, integrated into the UK. It's quite simplistic understanding, therefore, of nation statehood. But anyway, to jump into it, uh, there are two international agreements centering on Northern Ireland that shape and uh, deeply affect the UK constitution and in some ways this should be in such a way that it would be evolving so the UK constitution should change as a result of these two international agreements and that's not necessarily a bad thing. 
Um, one, of course, is a Good Friday Belfast Agreement, and the other is the withdrawal agreement, specifically the Protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland. And the reason for the existence of both of those international agreements is because, uh, to state the obvious, Northern Ireland is a very distinct part of the UK, and um, it is not possible to understand um, Northern Ireland ex um, except um, if you appreciate that the um, simplistic overlapping of territory, sovereignty, <coughs> identity simply doesn't work there. Um, you automatically have a conflict, and so therefore we have this um, uh, necessity to try and uh, think differently about borders and about governance. Um, uh, and in recognising that, we have the Good Friday Agreement, but we also have the protocol, which is attempting to recognise that distinctiveness of Northern Ireland. The objections to the protocol um, the loudest ones, I should say, and there are, there are difficulties with the protocol, which I'd be happy to talk about, but the loudest ones in some ways sort of reject that distinctiveness of Northern Ireland, um, uh, particularly this idea that it needs to be treated as if it was any other part of the UK. And I think that's immediately problematic as a, as a premise. <coughs> and I think a lot of the efforts to try and solve the protocol are very much about um, politics and principle rather than the technicalities at the moment. Um, and if actually we wanted to try and address some of the fundamental difficulties with the protocol, it would be better to recognise and enhance Northern Ireland's distinctiveness, i.e. Uh, the UK government itself could bring forward more um, uh, um, direct representation from Northern Ireland, could have done that in the past, must do it now, um, not just elected representatives, but also officials and stakeholders, um, so that we could have better um, understanding at the UKU level of the experience of the protocol um, on the ground. Um, Northern Ireland um, is demonstrating right now the difficulties and I don't want to say a crisis, but it's, it's a very difficult place for unionism. Um, it's all over the shop in Northern Ireland and in a very... <clears throat> Uh, even the news this morning is demonstrating um, quite how serious the situation is. And I don't think the UK government has necessarily helped unionism in Northern Ireland in any way uh, in its handling of Brexit and the protocol. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, almost infamously now, uh, the findings of our poll, the Queen's Lucid Talk poll, um, on the protocols show that levels of trust in the UK government is at 4% when it comes to managing Northern Ireland's interest in the protocol. And, you do um, wonder where they find that 4%. <laughs> uh, well, I can tell you, it's in very specific quarters of <laughs> older DUP supporters. Um, and uh, uh, and, and the, mm. the, you know, the approval ratings of Boris Johnson and uh, Brandon Lewis are very, very low. Um, and you can understand why, first and foremost, they came into it downplaying the significance of the protocol, and now they're emphasising the significance of the protocol for the union, right? So where is unionism meant to go with respect to that? And um, uh, if, 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 in case you're not aware, um, um, just last week we had a very serious incident in which the UVF, or allegedly the UVF, were involved in hijacking a van and uh, um, saying there was a bomb in it to um, threaten the, uh, uh, the Irish Minister of Foreign Affairs. And the response of the Secretary of State to that was to say, not to say the Minister for Foreign Affairs from the Irish government is welcome in Northern Ireland. This is an important part of the Good Friday Agreement. He was speaking at a cross-community event, etc. But instead he said this shows that there are a small group of people willing, still willing to resort to violence, which sends some, it's ambiguous, worryingly, I think. Um, and then we have Ian Paisley Jr. saying the, this British government only listens to on the street politics. And what's happening on the street today, um, except people who are canvassing in Shankill Road being told you're not welcome to canvass here, um, except we're having election posters being burnt, except we're having dog BT UP leaders, um, constituency office windows broken. So. Unionism is in a difficult place, um, and I think the British government really needs to think seriously about how it's, um, how it's handling all of this. And just last but not least, that election that we have is going to be a critical juncture. Um, very significantly, the Northern Ireland Assembly has 
performed remarkably well um, in the, in just before it broke up. So uh, uh, pieces of legislation that people only dared hope of and for, and actually quite progressive ones too, with respect to um, paid leave for victims of domestic violence, for example. Um, things that really matter. We're coming into a huge crisis, cost of living crisis. Northern Ireland's um, standard of living is, is below the rest of the UK. And yet this election could well be dominated by the issues of the protocol. Um, and the formation of an executive afterwards could be held up by issues of the protocol and the UK EU's agreement or, or failure to come to an agreement. Um, so the, the future of um, the, the functioning executive, executive and assembly really is tied up with this UK EU relationship, but most particularly how the UK sees its um, objectives um, at the moment with respect to the union. And Last but not least, I would just say, you know, Northern Ireland is distinctive. Uh, you can't change that by imagining or wishing that it be different. There may well be a pro-union majority, but there is actually a pro or sympathetic to the protocol majority as well. So the question is, how can the UK government, in conjunction with the EU and in conjunction with the Irish, um, manage that, uh, that, that fact? Uh, and that's, uh, that's, uh, that's going to be really tested um, after this election. Uh, yes, uh, I, mean, I think sometimes the protocol is perhaps the sort of Schleswig-Holstein question uh, de nos jours, um, uh, and that the UK government's attitude to Northern Irish problems perhaps, or to at, uh, the UK government's answer to the Irish question is to ignore the fact that there is a question. Um, and yes. Nicola, is that also your view of how <laughs> This place, Westminster, views Scotland and particular issues that uh, Scotland poses for the United Kingdom. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think I don't think it's so much ignoring. Um, the, we talked um, for a long time um, after devolution was introduced that there was a sort of policy of of devolve and forget. Um, so devolve powers and then just sort of let Parliament get on with it and then not really do um, much else. And that's not what we're seeing at the moment. Um, I think the current administration is in some ways, in some ways contesting devolution, I might come back to that, um, but also um, seeing itself as uh, um, government of the United Kingdom moving into um, areas of policy um, that are under the constitutional arrangements devolved um, and seeing it having a legitimate role to do so. And I can debate whether or not it does, um, but that's that's a, a new approach. It's a departure. Um, on the, the federal question, if I can mm -hmm. go to that one, um, I think we'll have to make a distinction between federal principles or federal features and federation as a constitutional arrangement. And we do have some federal features in our constitution. Devolution is arguably a federal feature in terms of a willingness to, to, to decentralise, a willingness to share power. But we are a very long way um, from a federation. Federations come in all shapes and sizes, a um, variety of different features, but they have some things in common. They have in common a commitment to balance diversity and unity. Now, we do not have consensus in all parts of the United Kingdom that unity is something to be valued and treasured. And I think, um, I, I can't imagine a federal solution, um, if you like, um, appearing and being accepted until you get to the point at which you test that question of whether or not there is a commitment to unity. In the case of Scotland, that means on the issue of independence, also, uh, there are issues about questioning unity in Northern Ireland too. Another feature, it means balancing a commitment to um, political autonomy for constituent units with sharing power, genuinely sharing power. Um, and we are, uh, again, a very long way from that. There has within devolution being, um, as Carbon talked about, throwing powers at the, at, at the Celts, um, but much less interest in thinking about how those powers interact with the things that remain reserved to the UK Parliament. And they cross over a lot, even more so now, um, because of changes to devolution, because of Brexit in particular, 
um, in, in ways that they didn't in, in the beginning. And there's been massive challenges in the system of intergovernmental relations um, that are not just about machinery, they are fundamentally about culture and political culture and the willingness to share power. If you were going to move towards a federal system, you would have to have a constitutional entrenchment of the different powers and authorities of the different units. And that means, again, I'm echoing what Carbon already said, that means that you effectively have to end parliamentary sovereignty. And I see no appetite whatsoever uh, for that uh, to take place. And the interesting thing about federalism or a federal system um, which is very different from devolution is that federalism has to be a whole UK solution. I don't necessarily think it has to be a symmetric solution, but it is something that happens to the UK. Devolution is too easily perceived as something that happened to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, federalism is by definition a whole UK constitutional reform and that of course raises very big questions um, for the governance of England. Um, final point for me for now is, and it's going back to the, the, the point about um, federal spirit, Sometimes I think the question about is, is federalism the way forward or various types of questions like that is that people think, oh my Lord, there are stresses in the UK, there are stresses in the union, of course there are stresses in the union, and how do we fix it? Okay, what is the solution? And my point would be, there isn't one, because having a plurinational state, having and recognising and valuing the diversity that comes with that means that whatever the constitutional arrangement, whatever the constitutional settlement, you have to manage those relationships and negotiate those relationships on an ongoing basis. And that's where you see in federal systems a federal spirit, a, an idea, a spirit, a valuing of working cooperatively together, not always agreeing, sometimes fighting, sometimes vehemently disagreeing, but it's part of the system. It's part of a federal system. And we don't, I don't think, have that in the UK at the moment. Super, thank you, Nicola. Um, uh, it was Pierre Trudeau, wasn't it, uh, who said of Canada and the United States that uh, Canada's difficulty was that it was sort of in bed with an elephant, um, which is perhaps somewhat uh, akin to the way Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland sometimes view uh, their relationship with the UK and England within that. So, Tony, can you give us the view from the elephant's perspective, if you like? <laughs> um, you know, uh, devolution, obviously there is devolution within England, but yeah. it too is uneven and asymmetrical. Um, if people are talking about revamped constitutional uh, arrangements for the UK as a whole, that obviously has certain implications for the English question. Um, but can the English be made to be interested in the English question? A very good question. I mean, it is interesting that here we are um, yet again considering indirectly the need for a written constitution, and I know that, that comes next in the programme, and it is begged by this panel as well, as, as has already uh, been stated. I mean, it is curious that England, which is 55, 66 in population terms of the United Kingdom, is simultaneously overpowered and underpowered at some level. It's got all those MPs. If they wished to assert themselves, which I don't think they could as England, they could. On the other hand, um, uh, you know, inevitably there's a degree of underpowered because devolution doesn't really function in England in anything like the same way it did in, does in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And of course, the one effort to create, as the Blair government imagined, a regional government in England, which was a pretty underpowered version of the thing, in 2004 with a referendum in the North East, went down with all hands uh, because, quite understandably, people in the North East didn't see what was being offered there as anything like what had been offered in Wales and Scotland. So then we're left with England, with centuries of uh, centralisation, one of the most centralised, largest democracies in the world. There was a brief period in the 19th century when there was, you know, it wasn't devolution, but cities, you know, when the British government was more interested in the rest of the world, the empire and all of that. There was a degree of power in big cities throughout the United Kingdom, actually, long before devolution. But... 
Uh, since 1945, we've seen, certainly in England, uh, the endless extension of what you might call Greater Whitehall. So, what's interesting to me from the, an English perspective is that what happened in Scotland and Wales in particular proves that you can devolve a substantial amount of power, and indeed fiscal power, within the United Kingdom without the sky falling in. Uh, Scotland and Wales remain you know, let's just make it neutral, it's as well run as England, let's put it that way, as a <laughs> former First Minister sitting alongside me, but let's just assume it's as well, or no, not noticeably differently better or worse uh, than uh, the UK Parliament in England. Um, but there is this challenge that, to get towards the symmetry that Carmen was referring to, in a sense, we all know you couldn't really have an English Parliament and First Minister, could you? because it would be so big that the First Minister and the Finance Minister of England would have a bigger budget than the UK Federal Government would. So then you're pushed back down to regions. Well, that's ruled out because of not only what happened in, in the North East in 2004, but actually subsequently combined authorities have come along based on city regions and then sort of groups of counties in sort of county city regional things, combined authorities. So we've ended up with it as ever in the United <coughs> Kingdom, but this time in England, with a patchwork. You've got London's got one arrangement, Greater Manchester and the West Midlands, Birmingham Mary have another arrangement and so on across the country. Many parts of England don't have devolution in this form, in the English form even. So the question is really how one might move England forward to have something which could be seen as a form of devolution which would allow a read across and a degree of equality with Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. I think that's the, 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 the question here. So what might it be? Well, I think you could move to a consistent version of combined authorities either in cities or in more rural areas. They wouldn't, I think some of them would have mayors, some of them might have governors or some other word as their, as their political leader. You could imagine doing that right across England, giving them greater powers, giving them uh, some fiscal autonomy. And by the way, congratulations to Wales and Scotland for managing to get some fiscal autonomy uh, because the Treasury do not uh, like this idea when it comes to handing their tax control to anybody other than themselves. So that was a, a remarkable element of what has happened in Wales and Scotland. So I think it would be possible to come up with an English solution, but it's not going to be regions, it's not going to be anything like Wales and Scotland or Northern Ireland. It will be something in England that can be described as devolution, but it won't be the same. I think that's the nearest we can hope for, given the powers that are fighting against it. And finally, what are the obstacles to this? Well, the first is that unlike devolution to Edinburgh or Cardiff or indeed Belfast, there were already civil servants and a political system there. You'd have to break up Whitehall. And that's very difficult for the civil servants and ministers <laughs> who operate there to countenance. They've spent all this time getting to the top of these huge departments, and lo and behold, we're now going to break them up and give all their powers to people in cities and towns and counties out there. So that's difficult. I think you have to add to the fact that if you don't have a big break, as occurred in Scotland and Wales, you end up with the problem that in Whitehall, deep, deep down, they don't trust subnational government. They just don't think it's up to it. That only the Rolls-Royce minds in Whitehall really know how to make these excellent decisions about procurement, all the wonderful things that the NAO reports on. And so that somehow you couldn't let all these people out there make these decisions which are going to be so much better made in this particular postcode. Nicola referred to this, and I just say, even within England, there's some pulling back from devolution to London. There's definitely a sense that London government is too powerful and separately levelling up has empowered the UK government to start spending money in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland directly and that's not a mistake. That's a reassertion of the unitary state as we saw with the Brexit negotiations of a kind that I think has profound implications for the union but as yet is much under discussed although I'm sure UK and Changing Europe will be doing it soon. So uh, last but not least... And this point I know is going to come up. There would have to be a different constitutional settlement to allow a federal version of the United Kingdom. 
Given the evolutionary tangle and change that's led to where we are, it looks to me far more likely that England, along with Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland, will continue to evolve down a devolutionary path, but it will, it will remain, to use a technical term, a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, I think from all of that, you, you know, one gets a, a, a reiteration, if you like, of uh, the fact that the United Kingdom is a deeply weird country. Um, you know, really quite genuinely quite unlike almost anywhere else. Um, uh, and so it has to make it up as it goes along um, in the grand old British tradition of muddle. Um, uh, Carmen, I was wondering, we have a minister for the union, who is also the prime minister, um, uh, who is on record as saying he considers devolution to be a disaster. Uh, how do you square being prime minister of a devolved United Kingdom with that view, and to what extent is the current Prime Minister an impediment uh, to the better functioning of the Union? I don't imagine you have any views on this whatsoever. <laughs> I think the ultimate lesson for anybody is to think before they open their mouth. <laughs> because that's not what Boris Johnson did, I think, on that, on that occasion. As you can see, his views are very strongly supported by the people of Scotland, uh, who very much support devolution. I think, it's, I think it's just Victorian. I think it's just out of date. If you look at, let me take Wales as an example. In 1979, the people of Wales rejected devolution four to one. Uh, one of the reasons for that was many people worked for the British state, quite frankly. They worked for the NCB, they worked for the British Steel Corporation. They had a, 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 a stake in the UK state that disappeared over the, over the next 20 years you know, with, with uh, privatisation and with the rundown of so many industries. People in the 70s would have said, well, what is the point of having a devolved government? Won't that jeopardise our jobs in the big nationalised industries? Uh, and that actually, the privatisation undermined uh, the case against devolution in that way. In 97, we had a referendum where it was very close, a majority of 6,721. You can see it's engraved in my head somewhere. Uh, in favour of devolution. And yet... In 2011, we had a referendum on primary powers, which basically went, it was a two paragraph long question, which was distilled down to do you believe that all the laws that only affect Wales should be made in Wales? We had an easy two to one majority. Easy. All the opinion polls show that devolution is very strongly supported by people in Wales. There was an abolished party that stood in the election last year. It got 4% of the vote, which gives you an idea of the strength of. Um, the desire to abolish devolution in, uh, in Wales. We've seen opposition to devolution drop over the past 25 years. If you consider that nearly half the population were against devolution in 97, that has dropped over 20 now, and it's mainly the older population. If you look at those in favour of independence, that's about a third of the electorate, which doesn't sound much, but it's historically very high, and it's certainly increased a lot over the past two years. Yeah, let's not over-exaggerate here. If there was a referendum on independence in Wales tomorrow, it would fall. However, amongst younger people, there's a much more even split, 50-50 actually. And there are a lot of people out there who are interested, who are not against the idea of independence in principle. They just don't see it working practically. So that debate is still ongoing in Wales. And that's what makes it different in terms of Wales, Wales and Scotland, less so Northern Ireland for the reasons why uh, Katie's outlined. Wales and Scotland see themselves as nations uh, and want to be nations within the UK. It's very different to the dynamic that drives devolution in London or drives de potential devolution elsewhere in, uh, in the UK. And that it's not simply a question then of saying, well, let's just have federalism across the UK because Wales and Scotland just wouldn't accept being the equal of the northwest of England. When I sat in government in Wales, our equal was England. It was much bigger, but that was it. Our, our equals were, were ministers in Whitehall and not, and not anybody else. And that, you know, once you've developed that thinking, you can't easily get away from that. And that, again, is an obstacle to uh, what we would regard as, as formal federalism. Uh, I mean, Nicola, it's a question of, of status, as Carvin says there, so, but also of, of, from a devolved administration's point of view and the, the sort of mentality of, uh, the, of voters in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland as well, isn't it? Uh, of, of trust at an intergovernmental level and so on, but more particularly, more importantly, perhaps, of a, a sense of esteem and respect 
Um, to what extent has that been challenged, if you like, in the post-Brexit era, and is there a way in which these things can be improved or, or fixed, or is a sort of culture of um, uh, mutual suspicion uh, our guaranteed and permanent future? Um, I mean, it's, it's in terms of relationships between the Scottish Government, I think I would add the Welsh Government into this too, and their combined relationship with the UK Government is really poor. I mean, there is very little trust, as far as I can see. Um, there has been a recent change in the machinery that might help that, but I think it will involve, um, I suppose, building in some elements of that sort of idea. There's a phrase that you hear ministers, certainly in Scotland, talk about a lot in terms of parity of esteem. And what they are referring to there is where they are responsible for agriculture, let's say, or education or public health, as we saw it there in the context of COVID. These are areas that are devolved and it's their responsibility. And when they are engaging with the UK government on these issues, the UK government is acting for England alone. And in those areas, they ought to have parity of esteem. So it's partly about status and recognition, but I think it's more than that. I think it's about voice, influence, power, co-decision making. Um, and that is really difficult um, in the context of a United Kingdom where one territory is so overwhelmingly large. Can you imagine the scenario where you build in to decision-making forums, um, co-decision as equals in the context of intergovernmental relations. Well, there are some difficult democratic issues that emerge from that. If you're looking at a, a nation of five and a half million, a nation of less than that, forgotten the population of Wales, uh, carbon, and, oh, yeah. and, and, the pop and a significantly larger um, nation in, of England on the same footing. I mean, there are some difficult democratic issues uh, emerge there if you are to build in more co-decision and common decision making. Um, we don't really have that. Um, sometimes there is a call for it, but we don't really have it. And maybe there are some advantages to enhancing the devolved authority over areas for which they have responsibility. Um, when it comes to the shared powered aspects of any federal system, then that becomes a, a rather more problematic. But on the other hand, if you look at some of the features that we tend, that are often talked about, it appears in Labour manifestos, it appears in Lib Dem manifestos at every election, about a, a chamber of the nations of, uh, the nations and regions. Of, uh, get rid of the House of Lords, replace it with a, a, a chamber of nations and regions. That will do nothing to go to the points I was talking about, a voice and recognition of nationhood. Um, because I do think that recognising the plurinational character of the United Kingdom is, from a, a, a Scottish and Welsh perspective, extremely important. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the one of the things obviously we've seen in the COVID era in particular, and I ask you all perhaps for your thoughts on this and so on, is, is uh, a demonstration of uh, Westminster's um, uh, limited authority on lots of matters. The fact that Boris Johnson um, is simultaneously uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, but also on lots of matters only Prime Minister of England. Um, and it's not always clear that he knows which hat he's wearing at any given point, perhaps. But to what extent has uh, some of the, the things that have become apparent, you know, with public health and other matters and so on, changed people's understanding of the United Kingdom and how it actually exists in the last couple of years? And, or has, has that happened at all? And if it has, what implications might stem from that? Tim. Well, I mean, <clears throat> the sort of slightly odd competitive public health policies that were pursued during the pandemic, um, intriguingly probably haven't led the four nations of the UK to a particularly different place at the end of it than if they'd had a single policy. I mean, I'm not a public health expert, but it kind of looks, at, and this is true not only of the UK, but other countries in Europe, that they've adopted slightly different policies from time to time and place to place. But in the end, the impact is not as 
um, dissimilar as perhaps it felt at the time. That, that was personal observation, hard to prove that. What I would say is that the, slightly pushing against your question, Alex, is that the massive firepower of the UK Treasury, I think, was important during the pandemic. And I'm not sure that that would have been as easy for smaller nations, he said, at a risk of being controversial. Uh, I think that the capacity of the UK as a financial institution to act is still very significant. So that, that's pushing slightly against your question, I think, mm -hmm. to be controversial for a second. <coughs> Katie, what's your view? Mm -hmm. Um, well, just to pick up on Tony's point there, I mean, um, certainly unionists would emphasise the, um, the importance of the, of the funding from the UK um, in response to COVID um, and, the, and the, the COVID challenge um, ultimately showed, I'm sorry to repeat a point, uh, the distinctiveness of Northern Ireland in having to uh, um, uh, be cognizant of what was happening in Britain the rest parts of Britain, um, and also was very directly affected by the policies as they were moving in the south as well, in the Republic of Ireland. Um, and in some cases that was managed um, by the executive fairly well um, uh, when there was better communication between the British and the Irish. Um, where there was divergence then, it became more um, politically as well as practically difficult for the executive. Um, I write on this with Darren Litter actually in the um, in the report to do a plug for our report, um, and, and it's I think it is significant that COVID was a topic that we all had to cover in in that constitution report chapter. Um, uh, we've got a question um, here that if I can find it. Um, uh, from Joseph Edgerton, so on, saying that the, I'll th again throw this out to all of you, but um, the, the 2024 general election is, is, as he puts it, unlikely to produce a strong Conservative majority. Uh, and then he asks, can the union survive a hung parliament? Uh, to which I would add, um, can the union survive another Conservative <laughs> majority, uh, given where uh, the, the last 10 years has taken us? Um, what, what's your views on this? Well, you can see some very interesting scenarios, can't you, coming out? I mean, if it were not, let's say it was not, if the Conservatives were seen to have lost the election, but Labour didn't quite win it, then you're in one easy step into a uh, Labour plus SNP, Liberal Democrat, others uh, applied perhaps, uh, you know, a confidence and supply government. Now, the conditions for that would, of course, be very interesting to see how they panned out, wouldn't they? Um, so I think it, it depends on what the configuration would be of the hung parliament if it occurred. Mm. Nicola? Yeah. But your, this is your, your crystal ball here. Yeah, I, I, I have a, a fundamental dislike of crystal balls. But, <laughs> um, I mean, one of the things that I always find really interesting and fascinating, and it's a reflection of um, the majoritarian political culture in Westminster, is how disastrous from a governing point of view a hung parliament has seemed to be, whereas um, minority government or coalition government is the norm in the devolved legislatures, but it seems to be devastating and ungovernable in the context of Westminster, which has always um, struck me as a little bit odd. Um, of course, what would happen at that point? Um, could, could the union survive another conservative majority government? Yes, I think it can. Um, from a Scottish point of view, um, it would be problematic because I cannot imagine that majority Conservative government securing much support uh, within Scotland. It doesn't have to secure a whole lot of support for it to make a difference because the SNP is, is so dominant, um, as we saw in the 2017 general election where the SNP was still really dominant, but because they lost a big chunk of seats, it was seen as a failure. Um, so they don't have to gain too much ground from the SNP for it to be seen as, as, as a bit of a success and for it to dent constitutional aspirations. But leaving that aside, um, my sense of the UK government's strategy towards um, Scotland and in particular towards the, the independence issue is to wait it out. Because constitutionally, all the authority um, probably lies with the UK Parliament. I say probably because it's a little bit ambiguous 
um, as to whether or not there could be um, a referendum on independence, and I have no doubt that that will end up in the Supreme Court. Um, but even if the Supreme Court was to judge in favour of Scottish Parliament legislation, however it was phrased, it is within the gift of the UK Parliament to alter the devolution settlement, to make it reserved if they want to. Um, so I, my, my sense is that the Conservative government wants to wait this out and hope that people get fed up of the Constitution. And a lot of people are quite fed up of the Constitution, but it is still the dominant issue and it polarises all political debate uh, within Scotland, as you will know, uh, Alex. Uh, of course, in an Irish context, we've only been talking about the Constitution for, what, 140 years or something. So uh, that, that, that perhaps um, shows the way yes. forward for Scotland. Um, uh, Carwin, uh, Labour Party's position we have the, you know, the Conservative Party is formerly, obviously, the Conservative and Unionist Party. But there is a sense, or a case can be made, isn't, can't there, that, that actually the most important Unionist Party in the United Kingdom, or at least in Scotland, Wales and England, is the Labour Party. Um, uh, because only it can, if you like, form a government that is everybody's second choice. Uh, a government <laughs> that they can live with, even if they don't much care for it. Uh, whereas the Conservative Party is in a different situation in parts of the UK. Yeah, I think you're right. It's one of the dangers, I think, uh, is that unionism starts to become a, a particular type of unionism starts to be associated with the Conservative Party. Mm -hmm. So, for example, increasingly in Wales, if a union jack is flying, people assume it must be the British Legion or it's a Conservative order. It's, it's, not, it's not seen as a flag that, that necessarily is uh, seen as representative of all, of all the population. I think that's something that's happened in the past 20 or 30 years. Uh, and that's something, which is why it would be a grave mistake for the Conservative Party to try to rebuild a kind of Victorian unionism ba uh, based around a flag, quite frankly. And I, I'm sitting next to Katie where, who lives in a place where flag, people are obsessed with flags. Uh, but that's not the way to do it. And, and to try to go backwards, to re-centralise, the UK will not survive that. It just won't survive. People will, there, are, there are people who at the moment would not be in favour of independence, who would say, well, sod it, frankly, if that's the way they're going to behave, then uh, we may as well be independent. I think that's hugely dangerous. And I think you're right. Uh, there is a responsibility on the Labour Party to be the party of, uh, of progression when it comes to, to the union, uh, in terms of taking a fresh approach to devolution and the constitution. I think that's something that, that we as a party can and are getting to, to grips with. I think the most, in, in relation to, to, to the question you asked, what happens if there's a Conservative government, for example, um, or there's a hung parliament. I think the most dangerous scenario is a Conservative government that's elected without any seats in Wales or Scotland, because they could lose all their seats in Wales and Scotland and still have a majority. And I think that's, a, that's unlikely, very unlikely, but it's a highly dangerous scenario because it makes it very easy to portray a Conservative government in those circumstances as the English government. Uh, and I think that, that's hugely problematic. I, as I say, I think it's an unlikely scenario. And I'll tell you a story about the, um, the obsession with flags. There, were the, the, there is a UK government office in Cardiff. It's basically the HMRC, but they don't call it that. And they the put in an application for planning permission to put an eight-storey high Union Jack on the side of the building. <laughs> this, was, this created a certain amount of controversy, not least the fact that the building was on a direct route between the Central Railway Station and the Principality Stadium. Uh, so people in their thousands would pass it when they were at their most Welsh. You know, <laughs> Uh, it didn't go ahead. I mean, if someone had said to me, we're going to put an eight-storey high red dragon in the building, I'd say, that's just, you know, that's crazy. We're not going to do that. <laughs> I think, th I think I'm, I'm with Tony, finally, on the numbers. It depends what the numbers look like and who is able to form a government with a majority. If the SNP hold the balance of power, I've no doubt that the, pri the SNP will push for um, another referendum mm -hmm. uh, and probably look for things on top of that, such as UK government neutrality in that, ne that referendum. But much of it depends on what the numbers actually look like. If the Labour Party say short of, of a few seats, then there are options to do deals with other parties. But if the SNP are in the driving seat, then we look then at the situation in the 19th century with, um, with Ireland. <laughs> With, um, with, with Parnell's party in Ireland and what was done there. Well, that's something to look forward to, isn't it, Katie? <laughs> yes. No, just to say on the general election point, I mean, um, the general election that will probably be of most significance to the UK Union could potentially be the Irish general election. 
Um, given how well Sinn Féin are doing, how close they came um, to um, getting a majority last time, and uh, how likely it is that they may well form the next Irish government um, um, at around the same time. And so um, that would very much change the dynamics, not just within Sinn Féin, within nationalism on the island of Ireland, given that we could well have a, potentially have a Sinn Féin First Minister, um, but also what it would mean for British Irish relations. Um, and um, if things are difficult at the moment, which they are in British Irish relations, um, how much more difficult could they potentially be? <laughs> so, so the lesson is that things can always get worse. Well, absolutely, we're talking about Northern uh, Ireland. Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, is the growth of the Alliance Party, is another question we have here, is the growth of the Alliance Party, is that, does that point um, to some means by which, if you like, the, the sort of British Irish nationalist, unionist, uh, binary sense of identity can at least be, you know, some sort of middle ground can be carved out of that with perhaps replaced by a, a more distinct Northern Irish identity, albeit that's within both the United Kingdom and the island of Ireland. Mm. So uh, the important thing is not to conflate like alliance with um, a Northern Irish identity. So Alliance Party voters come from all backgrounds, um, those who say they're neither unionist nor nationalist, um, those who say they're unionist and indeed those who say they're nationalist. Um, and they did particularly well in 2019, I think partly because they were coming on the back of a sort of a pro-Remain, pro-second referendum uh, sentiment. So this election will be really critical for them. They're doing well in the polls. They're now there in the polling as third party. Um, um, and they're hoping to take a good number of seats. Um, but uh, this is a... This is why, it's, in some ways, it's a real test for um, the, the Good Friday Agreement, sort of this next generation now, um, because, as I mentioned, that sort of new legislation that we say saw coming forward, even whilst the executive hasn't been functioning since the end of February, does show the potential there. Um, and in some ways, people could look to that and say, well, this could work, devolution could work, and actually give us stuff most people, judging by the polls, most people care about. Um, and yet there is also the potential, you know, when we're seeing now already at this early stage of the election campaign, the, the polarisation and the, and the very negative um, uh, discourses and aggressive discourses, etc. You could just see people being <coughs> turned off voting altogether. So it's a real challenge, I think, for, for the Alliance Party now to um, give people confidence that um, you know, to come out and vote in the first instance, and that and devolution is worth um, uh, worth working for. Um, but as I say, the, the risk is we'd have a, a low voter turnout, and then uh, the, the hard lines kind of continue to be very dominant. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an excellent question here, which I'm not actually going to ask you to answer, because, but it just amuses me. It says, "Could a federal UK include Southern Ireland?" Um, <laughs> uh, uh, which I suppose is a thing that to, to every new problem, there's a very old answer. Um, uh, uh, but you know, to, to what extent? To, uh, one of the problems it seems to be for the the, the, the UK and so on is the. Uh, and Carmen touched on this earlier. Northern Ireland has its particular issues with this. So does Scotland. So does England. Perhaps increasingly. And so, on. you know, what is the British nation now? It obviously exists alongside and sometimes on top of uh, uh, Englishness, Scottishness, Welshness, Irishness. But you know, if one was to go in search of the British nation, where would one find it? Well, in a number of institutions, I suspect, some of which, you know, have been on rep outside uh, earlier on, um, and the NHS, and uh, which exists in different forms in four parts of the United Kingdom, but is still called, I think, the NHS everywhere, and that, that's a very powerful identity. Um, so I think in institutions and in... You know, we all know from the polling that people in certainly Great Britain, so carefully, um, generally have very similar attitudes to, you know, social issues, business, you name it. They're very similar attitudes to a whole range of things. So I think there's a great deal of, I mean, people in these islands tend generally have very, very similar views on many issues, certainly in England, Wales and Scotland, a bit different in Northern Ireland. So... You know, I think in a sense there is the long common history, which is, you know, it is what it is, and it, it, it undoubtedly is a real thing. 
and then in the armed forces, of course, you know, currently yet again on display. So, I mean, I think it, it, it's like everything else to do with the British Constitution, a bit random, but there we are. You know, that's why we're here at this event, in part. And I think what it means to be British looks very different depending on where you stand and where on these islands you, you stand. And that's always been the case. I think it's more the case now. Um, there was some really interesting research done by colleagues in Edinburgh and Cardiff on um, Brexit preferences. And in England, those who define themselves as British looked more like yeah. those in Scotland and Wales who define themselves as Scottish and Welsh um, in, in relation to Brexit issues. Um, I think the problem comes when you feel the need to try to define it, to try to put a flag on it, and that's when um, nations tend to feel most threatened, is when they feel the need to say who we are, and, and inevitably you then exclude people who don't feel that. Um, the UK, historically, has been comparatively unusual in being perfectly comfortable with being a union of distinctive nations. You often hear this phrase, the four nations, um, which to me mean England, Scotland, Wales and Britain. Nationhood in Northern Ireland is rather more complex. That's not what's, what's uh, referred to by the four nations, but um, there has been a British nation that people are comfortable with alongside um, being part of a Scottish nation, a Welsh nation, and so on. But they are fewer in number now than, say, 50 years ago. Yeah, um, so the mention of the NHS is really interesting because I, I think, um, so we see from the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey that um, the uh, health service is the one thing that... Um, uh, that many nationalists think they, they would be loath to lose. Um, and um, uh, also we see health, the provision of the health service as being the primary concern of people across the board up to DUP and traditional unionist voice at the moment. So including Sinn Féin though, it's health service that matters and, and the functioning of that. It is at the moment the NHS, um, which is very telling. For the DUP and TUV, it's the protocol, um, uh, uh, together with the union. So that's, uh, this, is a, this is a bigger question around um, how that, uh, about public-private. I mean, what, what, do we, what do we like about the NHS? You know, is it just the fact that it's free? <laughs> um, um, uh, or is it something else, um, uh, something um, collectively that stands for something? And perhaps we saw a little bit of that during COVID. Um, um, but that's something that would be worth um, keeping an eye on. And particularly, it'll be interesting after this next Assembly election, um, if we see... Um, the, the inability of the executive to be formed and, and the ministers who would continue on in shadow not being able to properly make decisions, if that would have then an effect on the provision of health, provision, etc., um, we really do have a challenge for um, the question of what, you know, yeah, what it is to be part of a, a functioning democracy or not. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Carmen, I wanted to bring back come back to something you said earlier and so on when you were talking about the, the, uh, the rise, at least as a, a theoretical or notional matter, of people being open to at least the idea of independence for Wales. To what extent is that um, uh, being pulled by the experience of devolution, um, which demands, in a certain sense, difference um, to justify it? Um, uh, and to what extent is it perhaps also being pushed by an, uh, a sense of, um, of England asserting itself, particularly with regard to, to Brexit and other matters, um, and by a fresh awareness, if you like, of the asymmetrical uh, nature and reality of the current constitutional arrangement? I, I don't think it is driven by constitutional arrangements. <clears throat> I think it's certainly in the past 20 years, it's just been a trend mm -hmm. that I think would have happened in any event uh, and I, I don't think it's a question of, well, devolution has led to difference. The difference is already there. Mm -hmm. It's just that the difference wasn't able to be expressed in, in a way that uh, perhaps was the case in the past. I mean, I, I didn't speak English at home. 
Um, none of my family spoke English. Uh, I, my family were from a village where everybody spoke Welsh. And so there was that level of difference anyway. You know, I, 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 always, I always felt uh, for a long time that, that the Britishness of the 1970s had no place for people who didn't speak English as a first language, mm -hmm. that somehow we weren't allowed in. Uh, and that was because, if you look at the old-style Britishness, it was very English-speaking, you know, inevitably, because it's <laughs> the majority language. By far, uh, whenever English football teams played, they were with the Union Jack. There was, a, there, was, there was a synonymity between England and Britain. Uh, and people, con people constantly uh, used the two words to mean the same thing. That has changed. And I think one of the major questions is not... You know, what is the British nation? I don't think we need to go looking for something that, that, is, that is there. And I think, you know, Nicholas is absolutely right. People wear identities, likely they have different identities. You know, most people in Wales would probably say, if you ask them, what's your, what's your nationality, they'd say Welsh. If you ask them if they're also British, they'd, most of them would say, yes, we are. We don't have to make that choice, we should be. The only part of the UK where that doesn't happen is Northern Ireland, where, you know, what, is your, what does your passport say? Is it an Irish passport or is it a British passport? And that determines your your identity in, in, in Northern Ireland, quite, not always, but quite often. And I think it's a mistake to think that somehow we can go back to those days when the identities of, of Wales and Scotland could be ignored and subsumed into a sort of English stroke British identity that was seen as one and the same thing. That certainly caused resentment. And, and a, lot of, um, a lot of people now who grew up at that time, you know, they will tell you, well, God save the Queen's the English anthem. They play it at English, for, for English football and rugby teams. That's it. It's not particularly British because it's also the English anthem. And the big challenge in some ways is to be able to separate out British identity from English identity uh, in, in that sense uh, so that all identities, including my own, which is a non-English speaking identity largely, can feel part of the UK. I mean, that's, uh, you know, because as you say, the UK has actually been a multicultural and indeed multinational uh, entity for much longer than, than many people we were here in first. England. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, the, the, the original Britons, of course. Um, uh, and, but we see that in England now as well. The, the, the difference between English identity and British identity um, uh, and England being, you know, when we talk of multicultural Britain and so on, we really mean multicultural England. Um, uh, is, does that open a sort of path to a more relaxed kind of future for, for the union in which you can dip in and out of different identities? Um, you know, in one sense, the UK union is, is a genuinely liberal place in as much as it has an awful lot of time and space for people who would just wish to see it destroyed. Um, you know, and that makes it relatively unusual um, if you compare, you know, the UK with uh, you know, Spain's attitude to nationalist movements and so on. Is there a way within that of, of finding a way forward that, that recognises both institutionally the requirements of the devolved nations and satisfies English aspirations as well? Or is that all just sort of airy-fairy nonsense? Well, if, if we knew what English aspirations were, if I just part that part of the excellent <laughs> question. I mean, I think Corwin's right. The, the you know, soft identities, you can indeed call yourself Scottish or Welsh or British or English or, or any mixture of these. And you can actually have several, actually. You can be you know, Welsh and English and British if you want to be. Um, and nobody really minds. And I think that's quite helpful. Um, what I would say that is going on which is a bit of a curiosity, which I hadn't really thought about to articulate till now today, is that, interesting, the levelling up agenda, which I referred to, which is in addition to reaching into Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland from Whitehall, has sort of triggered within England a slightly sort of degree of competition between the South East and the North. And the, I mean, there was, it, was, it was always there, but there are some funding streams now which are only available for places outside London. Think about that. So there are, even within England, there is sort of, uh, there's a slight sort of challenge created by levelling up, which pits bits of England against each other. And that, of course, is because it's so centralised. All funding for things like combined authorities and mayors and all levelling up funding is bidding for grants against other places, which is itself inherently terribly destructive. So I think that um, the, the broader issue of how England you know, it continues, I mean, just on this question of the flags, I mean, since devolution, there's no question. You do see more St George's flags 
English flags than you used to before, no question about that. Um, and that sort of overlap between Union flag, Union Jack, and Englishness, I think, is a bit more detached than it was before 1999. Yep. Yeah. 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 I mean, on the, the identity issue, one of the, the big challenges I see is that outside of Northern Ireland, there is no place um, in GB to give institutional expression to those who feel European. Um, and, <clears throat> and I'm not pretending for a minute that there was a strong, deeply felt sense of European identity in Scotland. I think it was there. Um, the bigger issue around Brexit was the fact that this was a decision that was taken despite the fact that the clear majority preference within Scotland was for that not to be the case. So the, the Brexit issue is not so much the European identity aspect, it's the not, not being able to um, allow the expression of Scotland's voice as a nation in terms of its national preference. And that, yes, we're talking about 2016, but that is important, I think, to everything that has happened uh, since then. It's important to the idea of Scotland as a nation uh, that asp aspires to make choices, whatever they might be, um, within the United Kingdom. And I think Brexit um, and the EU dimension is one of the major challenges in finding ways within the United <coughs> Kingdom that will generate consensus in the way that, that, that this state is, is governed. And I think unless you have a softening of the relationship between the UK and the European Union that can allow those sorts of institutional ties, perhaps in different ways in different parts of the United Kingdom, um, then I think it, I, I see it as really difficult to um, identify a, a kind of consensus arrangement in the near future. Anyway. No, just on the question of um, passports, I mean, one impact of Brexit, of course, has been to um, uh, draw forth all these people with Irish roots <laughs> in Great Britain uh, and of course in Northern Ireland as well and there was um, the famous tweet by Ian Paisley Jr holding his Irish passport um, on his way off to Washington for St Patrick's Day celebrations um, but yet we have a situation in which Doug Beatty as the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party gets enormous stick simply for saying that he is Irish as well as British. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of this... Because everybody here would consider him Irish immediately, well, you know, whether he wants to be or not. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point, actually, yeah. Um, which, which sort of explains quite a lot of where unionists are coming from in, uh, in their sense of needing to defend the union, not just from Irish nationalists, but from, from certain attitudes in <coughs> Great Britain. Well, there are lots of, well, Scottish, lots, yeah. lots of Scottish Tories and unionists and so on who would, who would have a lot of sympathy with that view as well, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, uh, we're coming towards the, the end of our time, zone, and I know we've sort of ranged quite a long way away from the, the question of, uh, of a federal UK in terms <laughs> of its uh, sort of constitutional <coughs> architecture. But I think that's partly because I think you all, have, all think that it would be in some ways quite a desirable thing, um, but that none of you actually see a way in which it can be delivered. Um, is that a fair summary? Um, and can it be, you know, and suddenly then it also then requires, I think you've all said, a written constitution, which is obviously the subject for the next panel and is a whole different kettle of worms. Um, so uh, on, 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 you know, to, to bring us back to the sort of starting point, Zonia, uh, does the UK require fundamental reform uh, to not just in terms of being governed better, but for it to actually continue to exist in, say, 20 years' time? And to what extent, if at all, is, uh, is that reform possible or likely? And, and what sort of shape would it take? So a couple of minutes from each of you on that, perhaps, and that'll wrap us up nicely. Tony, you... But, I mean, given we've ended up here, I'm absolutely sure that even without a written constitution, we could get a long way towards a much more federal version of the United Kingdom, because everything is so flexible and malleable. Um, I do think it would create a big role for a Supreme Court, or a sort of UK constitutional court. But uh, given that we know that we can um, endlessly move the UK constitutional <coughs> arrangements around in various ways, 
you know, I, I, I absolutely accept a written constitution would be terribly difficult to, to achieve and would take a very long time to do it. So if we can't do that, could we get a quasi or nearly federal version of the United Kingdom? And I think the answer is yes. I think we could. And we could certainly do it better than we've done it so far. So that's quite optimistic. <laughs> Nicola? So I find it difficult. That I don't see it as my place to advocate for any particular constitutional um, arrangement over another one. Um, we surprisingly perhaps haven't said anything about independence, Perhaps all again, because ultimately, if you're saying the UK may not survive, one of its biggest challenges in relation to the prospect of independence for Scotland. And that's not a neat solution either, um, because although it's clearly a live issue. It's the independence movement has clearly been re-energised by, by Brexit and for all of the reasons that we talked about. Um, it's really complicated now, much more so than it was the last time that decision was taken. So there is no guarantee that even if you get to the point of <coughs> a referendum that it, that it succeeds. And there's all sorts of reasons to think that that would be practically very difficult and politically very difficult to do. But it doesn't go back to the point I made at the very beginning. In a sense, whether it's devolution as we have it now or slightly tweaked, or whether it's something that looks a bit like federalism, or even whether it's independence, there, there has to be a continuing, continuing relationships and some sort of institutional um, expression for that because none of these constitutional arrangements change geography. Imagine COVID happened in the context of Scottish independence. Of course, they would continue to talk um, and, and agree some things together, probably. Um, in, some ways, in some ways, independence um, would demand more coordination between the administrations than is the case just now, as Katie and I looked at this in relation to the border uh, issue um, in the context of independence. So, my general point, I suppose, would be that constitutions, however you configure them, are not going to um, be a magic um, solution, a magic bullet, a magic wand to fix the problems that are inherent in the way that people work together, the way that they engage with each other. Uh, so there's, you know, first assume a unicorn, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then everything can be fixed. Uh, uh, Katie. Um, I agree with everything that Nicola just said. I mean, just to clarify a point I made at the very beginning, so um, according to the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, that a border poll question would be either Northern Ireland join United Ireland or remain in the UK. There isn't a kind of, would you like Devo Max kind of thing. There's nothing like that. Um, which means ultimately we are still, we're always going to be um, trying to, whether it's the context of within the UK or the context of United Ireland, having to manage the existence of Britishness and the existence of Irishness, of unionism and nationalism, whatever forms they take um, in, these, in these two scenarios. Um, so we're going to continue to need that flexibility, as, as Nicola was saying, and good ways of working together, not just within the UK, but also Britain and Ireland. Um, and at the moment, to slightly contradict Tony, just to add some uh, <laughs> interest at the very end, <laughs> um, I, I don't see us going in the I see us going in the opposite direction at the moment for for um, towards anything about um, federalism. I, I think things are uh, regressing in in some ways. There's a much more simplistic understanding of the union and what it takes to keep it together. Um, um, and uh, I think all, all the comments have sort of shown just quite how uh, uh, futile that is longer term if you want to preserve the union. Is, is that the problem, Carlin, that just, uh, you know, uh, that the, the fundamental problem is that the people running the United Kingdom don't actually understand the United Kingdom? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yeah. we and I'll explain why. I think, <laughs> I think what we have at the moment is workable for decades, frankly, but you do need a UK government that is both sympathetic and understanding. I spent 18 years in government. I sat down with a number of Secretary of States for Northern Ireland from 2010 onwards, uh, after the election in 2010, and was constantly surprised about how little they understood of Northern Ireland. You know, I, it, was, it was astonishing. And this permeated the Brexit debate. I kept on saying to people, if the UK leaves the EU, we will have a land border with the EU. And it just, it just blanked when he told them that. Uh, or said, well, of course, Ireland will leave at the same time as the UK, because Ireland's well known for following the UK's <laughs> leave in that, in that respect. Uh, I think there's a total lack of understanding. 
of Northern Ireland, but not just Northern Ireland, but of devolution and what it means uh, within the current UK government. And there's even less sympathy. The intergovernmental machinery that we have could work very effectively, but it doesn't. We have the Joint Ministerial Council, which meets quarterly. We have one plea. Oh, see, we had to, in the old days when I was on it, we had one plenary every year. Basically, everyone went there to shout at Whitehall ministers. That's all it was at the end of the day. Uh, and I'll tell you a story, just, just, just to illustrate this point. Uh, a finance quad where the finance ministers from all the UK governments used to meet quite regularly. Inevitably, a UK minister would turn up and it would be a different minister from the previous meeting. So all these different people would turn up not knowing what had happened in previous meetings and the whole thing would fall apart. And my, my successor, Mark Drakeford, told me the story when he was finance minister that he went to Whitehall to be uh, faced with a white, with a, with a UK minister chairing the meeting who had no idea what had gone in the previous meeting. This sparked a lively debate. Mark was uh, very strong in saying how unacceptable this was. Mike Russell, who was then the SNP's finance minister, was uh, even stronger, saying that this all amounted to, to disrespect uh, and a lack of credibility on the part of the UK government. Martin Muller, who was then the finance minister in Northern Ireland, went even further. He described it as a betrayal and started thumping the table. And this was all under item one on the agenda. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> and it could be so much better. It could be a, a forum where people can agree. And I'll give you an example of this can work. David Lidington and I, post-Brexit, agreed that powers would come back to the devolved institutions uh, where they would have done that naturally. But there were some powers that needed a UK-wide agreement, agricultural subsidies, the operation of the internal single market of the UK, the way fisheries operate in the UK. And we agreed they would sit in a cupboard, they'd stay as they are, and sit in a cupboard, and we would take them out at such time as we were confident there would be agreement across the UK as to how they would operate. Everybody had a stake in how, how that, was, that would operate. It's been ditched completely. The UK government has just taken it over. So the subsidy control bill, for example, means that, uh, well, let's start with the Internal Market Act. Uh, that's the, the rules that govern the internal market of the, of the UK decided entirely in Whitehall. Uh, and this avoids the problem, or doesn't recognise the problem, of the UK government being the English government at the same time. The subsidy control bill is worse because that gives, for the first time ever, Whitehall ministers the ability to direct ministers and devolved governments. That's never happened before, but it's there, section 50, clause 55 of the subsidy control bill. That's the road to perdition. There is, however, a better path. It was still there, frankly, until Boris Johnson became Prime Minister. It was, you know, I worked with Theresa, May, Theresa May's government. We got agreements. If you, it, the entire system rests on there being a UK government that understands and is sympathetic and, and treats with respect the devolved administrations. We don't have that at the moment. If that continues, long term, the union will be in trouble. Mm. However, if the government changes, I'd be more optimistic. But then I'm not perhaps the most objective observer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I just uh, uh, thank Tony, Nicola, Katie and Carwin for, for, for that. I think the, this is a subject um, uh, to which people may return in the future, um, uh, possibly for several years uh, to come, uh, whether there's a, a new referendum in Scotland or developments on the island of Ireland uh, or not. Um, the, the United Kingdom will remain a messy, um, unusual and uh, disputed entity, um, uh, which should at least keep us all in work for quite some time to come. Thank you all very much.